Welcome to the RotoQL Edge, the video interview series for DFS players to learn from the pros. I'm your host, Mike Sheikman, and here with me today, we're starting off with the best, the number one DFS player in the world, Max Dallery, Sahil Sood. Sahil, how's it going? Good, good. Not too bad out here in San Diego. Um, getting ready for a couple of these uh, football world championships over the next two weekends, so... Um... Well, it's pretty good. Yeah, it sounds pretty good to me. But what do you would you say is the biggest perk of being a DFS professional? Um, I mean, one is I mean you have the freedom to do whatever you want, um, manage your time however you want. I think that's pretty good. Um, and these live finals are always always awesome events. Um, get put up in a nice hotel room, parties, food, drink, drinks galore, and obviously competing for. Some uh, very large amounts of money. Um, and then you get to hang out with people who are somewhere interested. You may never normally meet in normal walks of life. And now you're kind of all together. So it's a pretty fun fun time. Good event. Hopefully, hopefully I'll get a top five this weekend. And, uh, Ab- absolutely. Sounds pretty good. The life of a DFS pro. So, uh, yeah, to learn more about Sal's story, like visit rotoql.com slash Max Dallery. We're going to get into a little bit here. Uh, Sal, uh, let's talk a little bit about your rise into the industry. You know, uh, you were just like many of us with full-time jobs and, you know, thinking about getting into DFS more and more. Can you talk a little bit about your start? Yeah, I mean, I started in, uh, 2011 uh, football season. Um, I think that at that point there was Draft Street, Daily Jowls, and FanDuel um, were three big players at that point, and two of them are gone. Um, and only FanDuel remains. Um, so I played a lot of the college football back then, obviously played NFL. Um, so yeah, so I obviously didn't do too well at first, um, I think. Thought I knew how, knew how it was gonna work. Um, definitely lost, lost a few times, but I uh, got more interested in it and kind of worked, uh, worked harder, able to get a little bit better, better in time. And I think once 2013 uh, NFL season came around, you kind of I think those were the first times we're offering a million dollars um, for first place. Yeah. But I think after seeing the industry grow, I guess it was like three, it's been three X pretty much every year. So at that point, I had an inkling that um, maybe this is something that I could, could do full time. Um, still obviously working full time at that point, but uh, the start of that point, at 2013 football season, I really started to take, uh, take this very seriously, thought that there was an opportunity if the industry continued to grow, that it would make sense to kind of pursue this, and obviously I enjoyed being able to do it. Um, yeah, so what, can you talk a little more about, like, was there like a big win, like a, a winning moment where you were just like, wow, like, I might be able to do this professionally? Uh, I would say there was a one big, I think it was just in 2013, I think specifically in college football, I was... I was just winning very consistently and uh, uh-huh. kind of playing, winning most weeks, 7 out of 10 weeks, 8 out of 10 weeks. Um, that year, I had a couple entries into uh, the FanDuel DraftKings Live Finals, and that was uh, kind of, I guess, I just had a very good football season. I don't think there was. And then at that point, the GPPs weren't, weren't what they are now. Yeah. Uh, even if you got first place in a GPP, it may have been... Ten or twenty thousand dollars. It's obviously a lot of money, but it's not like winning a million dollars in one weekend, which plenty of people have done now. So it was just a consistently good football season for me, and then at that point, I died. was pretty much taking this pretty seriously. Um, yeah, awesome. Yeah, I mean, I think this gets to sort of a larger point of view here for for pros that you know maybe the casual player doesn't necessarily. I want to understand is that like it's really a grind and it's about you know bankroll management and being able to do that over over a period of time rather than just one big win right yeah 
Yeah, no, I think everyone's going to have their good days, everyone's going to have their bad days. Um, I would think that I have more good days than most, but um, yeah. you have to be able to manage that and the mental aspect of uh, doing that, I think, is something that's uh, unique to some of the DFS pros is because how do you handle losing five straight days or three straight weeks in NFL, which is bound to happen. How, how do you handle that? How do you react to that? Are you going to do something different that was that got you success over a long period just because of bad three weeks? I just think those are tough questions in the bankroll management if you have. If you have a family, something that I think is really, it was, it was able for me to make decisions was I didn't have a family. I didn't have, well, it's a huge risk to take pro, but become pro or make that leap to kind of take this very seriously. Um, not having a family or just being able to have the freedom to do that is, I think, a big part of it. Um, yeah. You really think think long and hard about doing it if you had more people depending on you. Um, so that's that's one aspect of it that's, that can be tough, but uh, same point, we we'll all look to it. So. Got it, awesome. Yeah, so there was a point, though, where you did decide to do this full-time. I mean, could you take us back to what that was like, you know, like leaving leaving your job to do that? I mean, that's yeah. just I a mean, fascinating for me, thing. For me, my job was, uh, it was getting pr- pretty bad. Um, it was, we went through a lot of transition, a lot of turnover. Yeah. Uh, some of my coworkers I got along with were all moving on to pursue different opportunities. So it was kind of the perfect time. You saw, like, the light a little bit. Yeah, so it was a perfect time. It was something I was considering. Then I kind of hit this point where the job wasn't, job wasn't what it used to be. It wasn't something I was interested in anymore. Uh-huh. Like, the FS industry was growing, and it was a pretty, pretty easy decision at that point um, for me. It was kind of that combination of factors. It was like, you got to do this. You got to take this opportunity that I didn't. You don't know if you're going to ever have an opportunity like that um, yeah. again type of thing. Yep. Gotcha. Yeah. So I guess fast forward now, I mean, you know, you had a a big win that, you know, the DFS world was talking about in in week three of the NFL season um, and uh, involving, you know, having Randall Cobb uh, in many of your lineups. And it was just a really an amazing play. Um, Like, where were you when that happened? Uh, And, and also like, you know, when he then, got asked about it and said he wanted a cut. Just talk about that range of emotion. That just had yeah, to have been that, insane. That was definitely one of the coolest moments to kind of hear that Randall Cobb was aware of what he had done, um, although he's been uh, pretty much a dud for the rest of the season. <laughs> so. I made on my Twitter pro- pro- have a profile pic or whatever you call it, and uh, ever since then I don't think, he, I think he's had one good game and pretty much the rest have been pretty bad. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think that I was just watching the games at home, really. Um, most of the time, I just prefer to watch them, uh, watch them alone, or watch them with a couple, a couple close friends, nothing. Don't know if I'd enjoy watching some of these things in a bar or something like that. Too many know. games to check. Yeah. Yeah. Too many games to check, too many, yeah. I mean, too many people cheering. Um, when you're what, finishing up, when you're... When you're finishing up all those lineups, is it just more of a feeling of like relief than anything else? Yeah. Like that. I mean, yeah, just, it's, yeah, it's a lot of relief, it's, and you got to make sure that you uh, were fully prepared, and that that's all you can really control is your preparation. If you made any mistakes, anything like that, those those are the ones that, uh, as a DFS pro, I think you're in your control um, completely, like making sure of injuries and things like that. Making, making mistakes. I've made plenty of mistakes, but those are the things that really, really eat at you. Um, yeah. So yeah, it is definitely a relief, um, and then it's kind of a little, a little work, relaxation, enjoyment once, once the games start to be able to watch them, um, especially for NFL since there's so much lead up time to get in, and really, uh, really uh, gotta be on top of your game. Uh, yeah. The mistakes that are out there. For sure. Yeah, so uh, after that big win, did you did you have any you know guilty purchases, any any type of just big spending, any fun? Uh, 
Not really. I mean, I got girlfriend again. Same old. I mean, I was, I've been doing pretty well, so I uh, don't think I did anything outlandish after that. That's the secret, though. You gotta, you gotta take care of your girl so you can keep doing the DFS life. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, uh, it's tough hours. It's uh, the weekend. The weekends are just nonstop. All I really want to do is watch 30 hours of football. So <laughs> I guess that's most, pe- most people's dream, but I can say it's uh, my job. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't hold back. I want to go for a nice dinner, make purchase. Uh, but not, I'm not... Not but a flashy type of guy or extravagant in that sense. So yeah, cool. You can follow him at Max Dallary, M A X D A L U R Y on Twitter. You can follow me at the Real Sheik, Mike Sheikman at the Real Sheik. Uh, Let, nice, nice. You get me? <laughs> you like that? I get a little plug in there. <laughs> Some of us got to eat around here, Sahil. Uh, so let's get into our Twitter questions here. Um, you can tweet at RotoQL and ask questions for the interview series. So we have at Kevin Sports Geek who asks, how much do you worry about ownership in larger tournament games? Uh, I mean, it's definitely something I consider. Um, I think one thing um, you got to look at is do you want to have over the field or under the field in terms of certain players? Um, I think that's the way to look at it. Um, so you think of, I think there was one week with Todd Gurley who was, I think, pretty much a must play. Um, he was like 5K against the Cleveland Browns. Yeah. And uh, everyone was talking about him, and he was, I think, 66% owned um, in some of the larger field tournaments. So like that, that type of situation, um, I thought it was completely justified, and I had him on 100% of my teams. Mm-hmm. Um, but then there's other situations where um, a player might be 40% owned or you expect them to be 30%, 40% owned, and I'm not too bullish on them, maybe, and I'll go below the field on that. Um, I think that, in general, larger ownership of players is an indication that he's a good play. Um, I think it's not everybody's, not everyone's going to be on a player if he's completely a terrible play, but I think you've got to consider what his likelihood of being a great play, success, and how you feel about him, whether you take a stand on him, which is over the ownership field, which yep. is 40%, you're going to have to have him on 60-plus percent of your teams, or are you going to kind of fade him and have him way less? I mean, there's just there's no hard and fast answers in anything in DFS, but uh, obviously it's something that you have to consider. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, so we got to get going. Last question here, uh, Twitter question. Uh, what unique quality or skill do you feel that makes you stand out from other DFS pros? I guess to rephrase more, like, you know, what's the difference between Sahil, the, the player, you know, when he was starting out, you know, to the player that he is now? Yeah, I mean, I think it's obviously a lot of hard work is a big part of it. But in terms of uh, having the analytical skill set, um, that's something that I am very analytical um, and then the love of sports and I don't think you see much uh, overlap in those two fields I think most people that are pretty analytical don't like sports very much yeah um, that's one I think if you want to be good at anything you have to really love what you do so I mean having that love of sports is big and then and then the willingness to take risks um, because one becoming a DFS pro is is a big risk Playing the volume I do is always a big risk. Um, so I think those combinations, and then you combine those three things that are usually um, sports and risk may go together, but usually like analytical people are not very risky people. Yeah, um, yeah. So I think if you take that, those three combinations um, and hard work uh, and a little good fortune, um, <laughs> I think that's those are the three things that kind of uh, worked out. That question was from at Riffs, Rip Surf one uh, Yeah, so thank you, Sahil, for your time. I mean, I um, hope we can get you on the RotoQL Edge soon again. And uh, good luck in San Diego. All right. Thank you, man. Thank you, Mike.